Well, behind us, we run the largest institutional platform in the world facing professional investors. So hedge funds, mutual funds, and pension funds. And we run that live conversation every day. It's kind of like a live ideas dinner with the professionals around the world in about 20 countries. And one of the trends that we're hearing over the last couple of months is the possibility of a major M&A cycle, mergers and acquisitions, coming in to the energy space. Welcome back to another edition of Three Ideas, this time with best-selling author of A Colossal Failure of Common Sense and founder of The Bear Traps Report, a Real Vision fan favorite, Larry McDonald. Larry, thanks so much for coming on. We still have so much feedback for that last mega series that you did. I know you're still exhausted from it, but not too exhausted <laughs> to give us three ideas. Let's jump right in and hear what your global macro thesis is, because I know that'll be the underpinning of your three ideas. Well, behind us, we run the largest institutional platform in the world facing professional investors. So hedge funds, mutual funds, and pension funds. And we run that live conversation every day. It's kind of like a live ideas dinner with the professionals around the world in about 20 countries. And one of the trends that we're hearing over the last couple of months is the possibility of a major M&A cycle, mergers and acquisitions, coming in to the energy space. Uh, you have, think of Chevron and Exxon. Uh, four years ago, they had about $8 billion in cash. By the end of this year, they'll have 55, maybe $60 billion in cash. These are cash flow generating giants. And that cash is burning a hole in their pocket. And meanwhile, you've got companies like Southwestern Energy that are trading at two times EBITDA, forward EBITDA, uh, you're talking about companies that are sitting on massive reserves of, of natural gas relative to their market cap. So what institutional investors that we talk to are looking at for the first time in years, as you come into a new M&A cycle, as that approaches, the way you evaluate companies and, and, and that create valuations changes. And so if your reserves of natural gas relative to your market cap get you know, dramatically out of whack. And that's the case with Southwestern Energy, uh, AR, Entero, Chesapeake, there's a number of companies. But, but Southwestern in particular is, it offers tremendous value because after the dot-com bust, we had that classic M&A cycle in energy. Um, and we know right now ExxonMobil has been looking at Pioneer that's been publicly discussed. And so when, when a company like ExxonMobil comes in and very publicly is, is taking a look at, at Pioneer and companies in the oil and gas space, smaller companies. Uh, this sets up, I think, for a window of uh, potentially spectacular M&A over the next two, three years. Okay, so let's jump right in then with uh, Southwestern Energy, SWN. And if we take a look at the chart, I want to go back to about January of 2022, not all that long ago. This stock peaked at about $9.32 in May of 2022. And currently it sits around uh, $5.10. So why this company right now? Well, think of the geopolitical backdrop. Uh, you have, you know, the last 20 years, we were kind of a unipolar world. And all that means is if you think of the United States, Russia, and China, uh, you know, the U.S. had some friends around the world. Um, now, in, in recent years, especially with Saudis, so the United States and throwing the Saudis, now, um, if you think of, if you say you're the CFO of Exxon or you're the CFO of Chevron, and you see this multipolar world where there's more, uh, you know, stress in the global financial system geopolitically, you're going to want to have some reserves in, in kind of this hemisphere or in a safer spot where you can actually access them. And if you just look at the coal space, if you look at the natural gas space, if you look at the oil space, there's massive reserves around the world of, of say copper and, and all kinds of commodities that are under political stress and the getting access to them for the green revolution or any kind of transition that we're coming at, come, coming at us here in terms of energy consumption uh, is, is very, very suspect. So we think that these companies, uh, these major oils majors are gonna start to look at US assets and, and, and make acquisitions in that, in that realm. And just to play off what you were talking about, I just spent a couple of weeks in the Middle East. And, and to your point about Saudi, 
I mean, people all over the Middle East completely baffled still weeks after Saudi making that uh, rapprochement with, China, with Iran via China. I mean, it just has people who are geopolitical experts who know this space so well still scratching their heads. So that unpredictability sitting right there. I'm just curious, what's your time horizon then for a company like Southwestern Energy? Clearly, you're, you're talking about going long here. Just how long? Well, seasonally, if you look back the last 30, 40 years uh, for companies like Southwestern, even if you just look at Southwestern the last 20 years, Southwestern, SWN, um, what happens is a lot of times you go into the winter and there's an overstocking uh, where, especially this past winter, there was this you know winter Armageddon forecast for Germany, for the rest of the world. And the weather actually turned out to be pretty mild globally. And so this created this you know, major, you know, the this, this sector, including SWN, went up on euphoria and has come down on impatience. And But as you come into the summer months, you know, we get a hot summer, uh, you're going to have air conditioning demand. So seasonally, if you look at SWN, between the months of, say, March and, and May, your returns are, are quite impressive. It, it's almost 80% of positive returns for SWN occur in that second quarter, second, third quarter uh, over the last 20 years. So seasonally, it's, it's a great backdrop. But then if you look at, uh, most importantly, the, the LNG demand globally in terms of millions of tons, uh, we see this data up 300% between now and 2027. As, as This is a very well-known narrative. I mean, the, the German economy, the, the European economies need to replace Russian net gas. And so this whole dynamic around LNG exports and the, the new facilities in the U.S. and new facilities in Europe that are coming online also create a phenomenal backdrop for SWN. And any type of target that you have for them? I mean, I think we're, like we said, trading around five, $5.10 at the moment. Well, we did a trade alert last year in the five and a quarter range. It went up to about eight. We, we lightened in client trade alerts. Uh, and we've been buying it down here now. We, we think you get another shot at eight. Uh, you know, if we just think of simple risk and war reward, maybe your downside's four, four, four dollars for you know in a normal world, you know, four dollars, three seventy-five. But your upside potentially in a new bull market, secular driven, you could have an upside of, of potentially eighteen dollars. Uh, the previous cycle, you saw the stock trade in the well into the twenties. And Larry, we're open for questions. So if anybody wants to pop in and ask you anything, I know you'll you'll answer. But the, the favorite question I always have on this show is what would make you upend your view? Or I guess the better question here is what do you think is likely that could happen that would make you upend your view and say, you know what, time to cut my losses? Well, if we had a situation where, you know, the, the war, uh, the geopolitical tensions in, say, with, with the Ukraine war, if, if, if there was a peace detente, and then the world quickly embraced Russian natural gas in, you know, in, in a short period, like in a two, three year period, mm -hmm. uh, that would be a major reason to, to, to really uh, think, reconsider this, this investment. Hi, I'm Raoul Pal, the CEO and co-founder of Real Vision. The financial world is a complicated world right now. It's a really complicated macro picture, and there's a lot of risks. Real Vision and our YouTube channel help you navigate those risks. So subscribe now to the channel and never miss an update. There is simply too much going on. So subscribe now. Thank you. Well, I want to jump into your next trade, and that really centers around the U.S. dollar. So first, before we talk about the specifics, what is your view on where the Fed is heading now? Well, the, the beast in the market is hitting the Fed over the head with a two by four. And the, the serpent inside the market, we had the LDI crisis in the UK in, in, in the third quarter of last year. It was a vicious crisis, financial conditions tightened dramatically. And the Fed was forced on October 21st, there was a leak to the Wall Street Journal of a much softer path relative to the rate hikes they were promising. And from, from October to November, the Dow Jones Industrial Average in that period had one of its best 60 day periods in 40 years. So it's very clear the Fed clearly pivoted already once. And remember, a pivot isn't going from rate, you know, rate hikes to cuts. But when you're promising a gajillion more hikes and you and you take that and you tone that down by 80 percent, that's a pivot. OK, so that's the first pivot. And then 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 the second two by four that hit the Fed over the head 
was Credit Suisse and, and, and a number of U.S. banks that have, have gone, gone, gone into emergency status and, uh, and, and into FDIC, uh, in the arms of the FDIC. And uh, as we saw last night with First Republic, the Fed essentially, by holding rates up here, they are draining the regional banks of their deposits. It's a fact. We've already lost a trillion of deposits in the banking system. Many of those deposits are coming from the regional banks. So what I talked about in my, in my book, A Colossal Theory of Common Sense, the inside story of Lehman Brothers, is that whole anecdote, that whole, um, that whole response uh, to the Lehman crisis from, you know, from all the federal officials, from you know, the FDIC onto the Fed, onto the OCC, that response has actually created a backdrop that is in some ways helping money move into money market funds, which were backstopped by the Fed during the crisis. And it also pushes money toward big, uh, you know, too big to fail banks. So in essence, the financial crisis of 2008 is sowing the seeds of the destruction of our regional banking system. And at the, at the end of the day, if, if the longer the Fed keeps the Fed funds rate near 5%, they will drain the banking system dry. And so the beast in the market is going to force them to stop right here. And I think they probably cut rates by 100 bips by this time next year. So that'll obviously weaken the dollar there. I mean, the the conventional wisdom is the dollar is weakening. Uh, I was just reading a great piece. I mean, going over all different types of reasons the dollar is weakened. But I think what's clear for here in your trade is so many people think that the Fed will cut faster and more than other central banks. That's certainly what's happened in history. And so I think that's one of the reasons that would push you to maybe uh, EWZ, that's iShares Brazilian equities, uh, an ETF. Um, is, that the, is that your thinking there, that the Fed just goes and, and cuts much more than other central banks around the world, including Brazil? Yes. And remember, it's the, you know, one thing I learned growing up in the business is it's, it's what the Fed's doing relative to other central banks. That's a very important point. It's also like, what is the backdrop of the planet? So there's 65, well, there's, there's 70 trillion of GDP outside the United States. And there's maybe 27, 28 trillion inside. So 70 trillion versus 28. And so there's much more GDP outside the United States. 2022 is going to go down as a Hall of Fame, literally in the last 70, 100 years. You can't get a better backdrop for the dollar than 2022. China lockdowns that were endless, which suppresses global growth. Uh, the, the war in, in, in the Ukraine, which was just a, you know, a vicious stress on the global financial system. Um, the European economy was, was in, in a lot of stress. And the Fed, like you said, Samuel, brilliantly, is that the Fed relative to every other central bank in the world, Bank of Japan, whatever it was, the Fed was much more aggressive. Now, the next 12 months to 18 months, China's reopening. You got a stabilization in Europe to some extent. And the Fed is, is more done than other central banks in the world. That and, and just to interrupt you for a second, I mean, there are some people who think it isn't necessary that the dollar is going to be so weak. It's just going to be the strength of the yuan and the yen is one of those, you know, central camps that, that we see for everything else, uh, for or everything else. Just look, at, just look at the Bank of Japan, right? So this, like in the fall, the Bank of Japan was promising endless, uh, you know, what's called quantitative easing and, and, rate and yield curve control. Now, this is the Bank of Japan now. The Bank of Japan is talking about literally a change and a regime shift away from yield curve control, which, you know, that gets you from a very weak yen to a much stronger yen. So there's like all these dynamics. The, the United Kingdom was in flames politically, right, in the third, fourth quarter. Now things are, are, are stabilized there. So there's all of this backdrop that is, those were massive tailwinds for the dollars, uh, for the dollar last year, and now they're all, they're a lot, a lot more headwinds. But then the question is, how do you play this? So that gets us to um, EWZ. If we just take a step back, I, I wanted to pull up the five year on EWZ. We see it peaking at about $50 in January of 2022, and then hitting its bottom around $22.25 in May 
of um, 2020. I think I got my years off there because that wouldn't make quite sense. But you can see right there on the chart, you see where it's peaking, and then wow, goes way down. Currently, we're trading at about $30. So why this mechanism to play uh, this move in the dollar, Larry? Well, you know, emerging market equities, gold miners, there's a lot of things that when the Fed stops hiking, uh, that, they, that they outperform. Um, but so, so in general, you want to be more long emerging markets now than you were last year. Uh, you go back, you back 30, 40 years when the Fed is toward the end of the hiking cycle, you want to be long emerging markets. But, you know, countries like Brazil have a tremendous amount of GDP exposure to commodities. And because the Fed is softening the path with inflation very high, like the Atlanta Fed, the Atlanta Fed wage tracker is actually back on the highs and moving even higher. So there's still tremendous inflation pressure. But because the beasts in the market, because of financial conditions, are forcing the Fed to soften the path. That sets up a much like a whole new regime for commodities for the next 10 years. So your previous decade, darlings, you know, your tech stocks were disinflation, deflation bets uh, from 2010 to 2020. That was a dis major disinflation, deflation regime. But now you have a Fed softening the path. You have a Fed that's expanded the balance sheet by close to $400 billion with inflation above 6%. That is pure madness. If they wanted to kill inflation, if the Fed was serious about killing inflation, they would they would have let the financial crisis in the banking system in the United States burn for a couple of months. Instead, after one week, they expanded the balance sheet. They panicked. They hit the panic button. They expanded the balance sheet by close to $400 billion. That will fuel hard assets over financial assets. So commodities, value stocks, emerging markets over financial assets the bonds and growth stocks for the next five years. So that's your, uh, a pretty uh, clear time frame. Then what would your target be for, for EWZ trading around $30 right now heading toward? Well, I mean, it's, it's pretty much near the COVID lows, which is a great entry point. And, uh, and that's because of the stress and the political risk because of the Lula election. But uh, yeah, I think you can, you can get, um, you know, 38 to 42 dollars inside of you know three years and and potentially much more and what would cause you to upend your view on this one i think a whole lot would have to happen for you to to change course here no well you know the the, the, the wacky thing about latin america now is chile peru uh, to some extent colombia you have very you know leftist regimes that have come in uh lula is a known commodity. Uh, he was a former president, <laughs> no pun intended. So I think overall, there, there's that always that political risk with Brazil, but that's why you're trading on the COVID lows. <laughs> you know, so uh, the, 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 the money has actually panicked out of, of a lot of emerging market political risk hotspots already. And just to bring this back full circle, the people who are still strong on the greenback say that the Fed rate path is actually underpriced. Well, if they do that, okay. This this is the way, this is this is this is how you have economists in the United States. They're just literally smoking something very because if you do that, if if the Fed hikes another fifty bips, they will drain the banking system dry, and they will create like they're they're on they're on the nerve. Like you can't drain the U.S. banking system dry without creating a financial crisis right now, and not 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 to mention the Financial Times. And Moody's, who are not exactly first movers, are talking about commercial real estate has yet to be priced into the banks and their balance sheets and the earnings. So the banks have just begun, after losing all of these assets, they've, they've just begun acknowledging uh, this colossal stress that's coming from the U.S. commercial real estate market in our major cities. So the, the Fed is done. Let, let's just not kid ourselves. Yeah. Or you're smoking something, as Larry <laughs> McDonald just, just put it. And then that takes us to your last trade. And perhaps this is the most interesting for me because I've covered the tech markets for years. And that's shorting the NASDAQ. Now, the vehicle you could use to do that would be ProShare Short, QQQ, PSQ. 
I just want to bring up a one-year chart, though, of course, when you're shorting, it, it, people can often get confused because it's really the inverse of what you're talking about here. So I'm not going to dwell on any of the points, but we'll keep that up for a second. But walk us through the why. Why shorting the NASDAQ and why now, Larry? Well, in the first quarter, Samuel, as the recession risk rose and as this stress in the banking system came on board, all this money had to leave the financials and move into tech. And what, what's what's interesting about the last you know, 40, 50 years in markets is when you have a real crisis that comes on fast, um, there's typically a drawdown in the market that pulls, correlation goes to one like during Lehman and you have it, money comes out of the market. But here when it's a slow moving recession with you know, major band-aids from the Fed and things like that and the FDIC backstop, um, it's a slower moving crisis. So the money doesn't, it does go to cash. We have a lot of money in cash, but the money reallocates into what are called, you know, perceived safe havens. So all across markets today, and a lot of our viewers, they're going back to the previous decades, darlings. That's all they know. And they're assuming that the current crisis and the recession risk brings inflation back to one to 2%, because that's the only way that sector really works again. Uh, big tech stocks um, just don't perform well in elevated inflation regimes. They never have as, as a whole. And so you have the, the mad mob is rushing back into tech and they're assuming that we're going back to like a one, 2% inflation world. And they're assuming that the Fed's gonna cut, a lot, cut rates dramatically. The problem is when you cut rates from up here, then you're weakening the dollar and you accelerate inflation. So if, you, so if I can jump in, why do you what do, why do you think that those tech darlings can only work in in low inflation environments? Well, you're, you think about your net. That's a great question. Your net present value of all future cash flows. And I talked about this with Raul Paul literally right when I did this segment and right, right late 2021 into 22 about my prediction on the Nasdaq's demise. And in we, it's, this is all you can look at it on YouTube. The net present value of all future cash flows in a in a deflation regime is worth a ton more. So think about Netflix is doing say a, say a billion or two a quarter. They bring in the money, they reinvest it in the house. Uh, but if, in, if if you have deflation you're, and you're and you're redistributing capital within your capital structure within the company, you're investing it uh, in a in a deflationary regime that net present value of those cash flows is worth more. But in an inflationary regime where you have certain inflation that's say three to 5% that hangs around for multiple years, if you look back 1968 to 81, the type of stocks that outperform are materials, industrials, value stocks, commodity-based equities. And because the net present value of all future cash flows in, a, in an inflation regime, that hurts growth stocks and it helps value stocks. So uh, your time horizon for shorting the NASDAQ, going in on something like ProShare short QQQ PSQ as, as your vehicle? Well, let's, let's, t let's remind everybody, these, these levered ETFs are for professionals, okay? Yeah. They're extremely dangerous. Your timing has to be near perfect. Um, you know, I just think if someone's watching us right now and you're overweight NASDAQ, you know, just take down exposure. Uh, you don't necessarily have to get, this is for professional. And these things are massively levered. There's a decay factor where the portfolio, the, 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 the team that runs the, the SQQQ has to rebalance every day and basically short every day. So there's a massive decay. And so if the market goes sideways for two months and you're in the SQQQ, you're, you could be down 10, 15, 20%. But I just think, you know, sell in May and go away. The average FANG stock, they say your top 10 stocks in the NASDAQ, which are, are about 50% of the NASDAQ, right? So 50% of the NASDAQ are 10 stocks. And if you look at those 10 stocks, they're up on average, not even like 120 days into the year. They're up on average 30 to close to 40% because they had, they were, there was such, like everybody that was puking these stocks in December, puking them into the bucket is now chasing the rally. And to me, that sets up for a very negative, you know, next quarter or two for the major tech stocks, which, you know, the FANG stocks, which represent most of the S, like I said, the QQQs. 
And I mean, if we were to tease that out, then if you were, would you only go into something like the NASDAQ? I mean, really increase your exposure then once inflation got down pretty low, Larry? Well, these, you know, remember these these trends go for de for decades. I mean, the the deflation regime that we were just in lasted a long, long time. Think about this, Sam. This is a great point you just brought up. Um, after Lehman, we did two to two and a half trillion of fiscal and monetary response. Okay, um, and the, the thing about that Lehman crisis, if you take a trillion dollars and you put it into a box, you won't really create inflation that much. And that's what happened. They took a trillion dollars, they bailed out the banks, the money was in the banking system, and it didn't really create inflation. After the COVID crisis and this latest energy crisis, the last two that hit us, and where we're paying people's energy bills in Europe, and we're supporting the price of energy through massive energy bailouts, um, we've done about 12, remember Lehman was two to two and a half. We've done about 12 trillion of fiscal and monetary responses globally, maybe even say a little higher than that. So governments have massively bailed out lockdowns. They've bailed out energy, energy prices. So they're paying people's energy bills in Europe and they're paying people's energy bills in California. That's supporting the price of energy. And they're paying people to stay home. That's why the power of labor, it's very difficult to get people back to the labor force, people have been, people can get paid very well by working the system the last couple of years. So all of these things, the unintended consequences uh, are just that Cobra effect, which we blogged about two years ago, that Cobra effect creates a much higher sustained regime because of all these unintended consequences of inflation. And that basically means to answer your question that this value, versus growth regime where value is actually beating growth and, and commodity stocks and EM, this, this probably lasts at least five years. And what would be, I mean, if all of a sudden, I mean, you've kind of answered the question where I'm going, but what would be your first sign then if all of a sudden you thought, all right, the NASDAQ's looking sexy again, what would be, what okay. would be the number one sign? If we woke up tomorrow and there was another COVID, COVID virus that, that attacked the major cities of the world extremely fast, yep. then that would create such deflationary pressure that tech stocks would once again, and as you remember, tech in, in COVID, like you remember that first, second quarter of 2019, the NASDAQ, you know, where there was a drawdown, not that much for some of the, especially Amazon. And so in those kind of, in that kind of disinflationary, like, remember, think about this. You had the COVID variant, you had the Delta variant, you had the Omicron. Each time one of those hit the world, the NASDAQ dramatically outperformed value. So you've had these vicious counter trend rallies in, in, where the NASDAQ is outperforming value. And each one of them, there's like six of them since 2020. And many of them were driven by COVID fears, by a, you know, by your Omicron, oh, you know, all, and, you know, the, and remember, remember, there's all these people on TV that are paid to sell speeches and books, and they want to scare the investors to death on, on, on COVID, on any virus. And so that can take hold, and then that's what drives a lot of this move, a lot of that capital back into growth versus value. So to play off and, and just to, to finish things out here, I mean, you talk about the colossal failure of common sense, but we know sense is often not that common. So to achieve this soft landing that these folks would like, where what would be your prescription? No, not a high bar I'm asking you at all. Well, the pilot on the airplane when there's trouble in the engine is never going to tell people there's trouble in the engine, right? He's always going to say, ladies and gentlemen, relax, have a cocktail, stay in your seats, everything's fine. And that's the Federal Reserve at the end of the day. We have inflation at the high, one of the highest levels in years. You can't kill inflation with a soft landing. It's absolutely preposterous. The only way you can kill, kill inflation is with an unemployment at least five to 7%. And we're nowhere near that. So that just means that every time the Fed kind of softens the path um, and all of these government programs, we've done, we've done back to back $2 trillion deficits in the United States, 2020 and 21. And now we're gonna be close to maybe one point, another 1.8 trillion this year. 
So you just don't kill inflation with that kind of fiscal response. I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, it just it just doesn't work that way. So inflation hangs out, and uh, you, you're not going to get a soft landing until the I mean, you're not going to get you're not going to kill inflation until you get a hard landing. Yeah, he's, there's no there's no soft landing. And and just for those folks who say that the the banking crisis, even if it's now finished, if say that that helped the Fed along. I mean, it sounds like your unintended consequences are far more severe. And so you probably wouldn't buy into that narrative. No, that, that's a great point. It's definitely helped. I mean, it's created a, a big switch. And that's what's juiced the NASDAQ here, because everybody's perception is, OK, we're going back into this sharp deflation. But the problem is the Fed, within five minutes of this banking crisis, literally, they wouldn't let it go a weekend without a $400 billion and $400 billion balance sheet expansion after they told us they were going to cut, take the balance sheet down. This is just fraudulent, okay? And it's just, they they just, they, they're not conducting monetary policy to kill inflation. They're conducting monetary policy to put out a fire in the banking system. And that just keeps inflation burning. Any questions that you think I've missed, Larry? Um, I just, the last thing Elon Musk tweeted um, today or overnight around, you know, kind of one of my points is what, when you take the dollar as a weapon and you hit emerging market countries over with it every year for 10 years, you do force uh, money or you force capital away from the dollar. The dollar, the hubris in our government, whether it be Republican or Democrat, the last like six years is just off the charts. We have the world's reserve currency and we're using it as a weapon over and over and over again against multiple countries in emerging markets. Sometimes it's been very necessary, right? Russia, the war, I get it. But the problem is it's the type of weapon, and this is Musk's point, it's my point. This is the type of weapon that should be used once, maybe twice every 20, 15, 20 years. They're using it every on every traffic stop at every corner on every light and it's just the most disgusting example of political hubris where you have politicians that don't understand the implications of this policy and that hubris is very similar very similar to the to the lehman ceo and, and richard fold that whole management team that had a massive delusion around the risks that they were coming upon us and it's the same thing in the U.S. government now. It's the same thing with the Trump administration, same thing with the Biden administration. Both administrations used these sanctions very aggressively. And that, you know, those chickens are coming home to roost. I'm sorry. A lot of memorable lines from uh, got to be smoking to have faith in the dollar. <laughs> and, well, the soft landing just uh, ain't coming. Larry, what we do is um, we track everything. You'll have seen your buddy Larry Lapard on here a couple of episodes ago. Uh, people can click a link in the description, bit.ly slash RV, uh, three ideas. So we'll be keeping a close eye and then we'll invite you back for an, uh, a victory lap. Just any disclosures? I think it's just Southwestern Energy Co. is the one that you're personally invested in, correct? Yes, SWN is, is a personal holding. Yeah, that, that's there's definitely a there's definitely a personal bias there. <laughs> Larry McDonald, best-selling author of A Colossal Failure of Common Sense. Thank you for bringing your common sense to the table today. Thank you, Samuel. Hey there, revolutionaries. To join a community sharing insights like you just watched, head over to realvision.com. There you will get unbiased insights and exclusive access to the very best, brightest, and biggest names in finance. Be a part of our community of lifelong learners. See you there.